Good afternoon, bon après-midi. Welcome to this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. I'm coming to you live from the brutalist majesty of the Rutherford Physics Building at McGill University in beautiful downtown Montreal, where the zeros and ones run over Wi-Fi as thick and dense as the atmosphere of a proto-Jovian planet. If you're in the Zoom session and you prefer not to be recorded or live streamed, please log out of Zoom and join us via YouTube. This afternoon, we will have a 45 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. To ask a question in Zoom, please use the raise hand feature following the talk. To ask a question in YouTube, please enter it into the chat. The questions will be relayed to me by my sidekick following the talk. After the Q&A session, the live stream and recording will stop. Professors will be asked to log out of the Zoom session. And undergrads, grads, and postdocs, as well as other non-faculty in the Zoom session will be invited to the après colloque, a chance to get to know the speaker in a more intimate setting. With that, I will now pass to Professor Eve Lee to introduce the speaker. Eve. Okay, thanks, Phil. We're pleased to have Professor Yanchun Wu from University of Toronto. Yanchun is an expert in theories of planet formation, both in our own solar system as well as extrasolar systems or general orbital dynamics, as well as tides in both stars and planets. Um, she has been a real force in our field, um, solving many of the puzzling features found by the Kepler spacecraft, which really revolutionized the field of exoplanets. I'd also like to add that Yanchen is extremely good at distilling complicated physical processes into their very um, basics. So when I was still a second year undergrad at Toronto, I had an opportunity to sit down with her for about an hour, where she very patiently described to me the physics behind the dynamical migration of hot Jupiters by Kozai Lidov effect. Um, Professor Wu began her undergraduate studies at the University of Science and Technology of China, received her PhD at Caltech, and then completed her postdoctoral fellowships at Queen Mary College, University of London in the UK, and then at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. She decided that she liked Canada enough and has been a professor at the University of Toronto since 2003. Without further ado, please take it away. Thanks, Eve. Um, I still remember you introduced me last time when you were in Caltech. There was a uh, year, year and a half ago, so it's fun to be introduced to you again. Uh, in the same format. i um, very pleased to be uh, seeing McGill remotely and um, thank you for coming to my uh, colloquium. So today I'm going to talk about this simple topic called Generation One Planets. Um, it's a term that I made up. I decided that uh, we should call planets differently based on this thing called generation. There's either Generation One planet a generation two planets. Astronomers do that often, you know, whenever they see something on the sky and they don't look quite the same, they give them a different uh, classification, class one, class two. This is a little bit different from that. I'm gonna explain what do I mean by generation one or two. Um, I have a list of collaborators here, which are people who have passed through Toronto um, at some stage in their life and have contributed to this uh, talk. Okay, I was told it's a physics colloquium. So let me start with this sweeping overview of the entire extrasolar planet field. This is uh, all the known extrasolar planets plotted in one diagram, pretty much all the known ones, I think, in terms of orbital period in the horizontal axis and planet uh, mass or sizes, if you like, on the vertical axis. Every dot here is a planet and there are black dots and colored dots and so on. The first impression you should get out of this plot is planets are distributed in this phase space, not uniformly or randomly. Instead, they kind of congregate into uh, particular clumps, which we call populations. As you can see here, there are a couple, a few populations we now know even though we only have a few thousand planets, we now know there is a population called, say, hot Jupiter. They were the first exoplanet we know about. They were up here, Jovian-like planets, but I put in the sun with 1% of the distance as our own Jupiter. And there's something called warm Jupiter, and then there's something called cold Jupiter. So even Jovians have three different populations. And down here, this is all these green dots, which I'm going to talk about exclusively today, which I call them Kepler planets. 
but other people call them by their so, uh, more nuanced names like super Earths and mini Neptunes. And there's also other some smaller populations here. The perspective here is to compare this to the solar system. We have the terrestrial planets. So down here below Earth's masses or around Earth's masses with this Earth sitting here. And then we have some giant planets like Jupiter Saturn sitting out around here and Neptune Uranus sitting around here. So the solar system planets sitting at the face space which is further than the detected population in general. And that's just because our current technical uh, capability is not good enough to detect many of the solar system planets. It's not because they shouldn't be there in those solar system. Although in this talk, I think at some point, I'm really starting having a crisis. As we starting asking ourselves, is our solar system really normal or abnormal? Um, the colors here in this part shows the more or less the detection method. So all the color dots came from one single detection method called the transit method. So the incredibly simple idea that when the planet happened to be going from the star, from the Earth's uh, perspective, we can detect it. That's called the transit method. And it represents something like 80% of all the planets known. And it's all discovered just by one single space mission called the space, Kepler space mission. And the other point I want to make on this graph to unify all this graph is almost all the planets on this graph are what would I call generation one planets. By that, I mean planets which are formed around their host stars very early. Because when the host star was born, they typically are surrounded by some kind of, you know, leftover gaseous disk, which we call protoplanetary disk. And after a while, those gaseous disks dissipate for some reason and leave the system. The planet, generation one planet, has to be formed within that short amount of time. And that's about a few million years. So I'm making the claim that all these planets you see here are really formed within that first few million years. Of course, there's also the generation two. Earth is a generation two planet. Earth is not formed, we think, in the first few million years. Rather, Earth is formed after the disk actually has gone away. And for some reason, one way or the other, around the sun, they still orbit some kind of you know, junks. By that, I mean some kind of solids, silicates, irons, and solid materials, which are um, still orbiting the sun, very small amount, and those material gradually conglomerate, collide with each other, and finally form terrestrial planets. And that takes a few hundred million years to finish. That's what I call them generation two planets. But today I'm just gonna focus, okay, I'm mostly gonna focus on the generation one planet because we find more, many of them and we now actually know learn a fair amount about information about them. This is that famous Kepler mission. This is not a Kepler mission. This is the patch of the sky with a Kepler mission, um, which is a big mirror about one meter diameter, continuously stared at for about four years. In this, what you see there is that each little square is one of the CCD's cameras on the Kepler telescope. And within each square, there are about a few hundred thousand, 50,000 stars or 30,000 stars. And what Kepler does is laboriously keeping track of all the light fluctuations in that star for four continuous years. Of course, when Kepler was sent up, um, it has to go I didn't want to go there. The Kepler has a single, very modest goal of discovering Earth-like planets around other stars. It thought that initially we thought that well, if they stare at this patch of the sky, even though it's only you know a tiny fraction of the entire sky, but there are enough stars in there, and if we can monitor those stars sufficiently accurately, after four years, Kepler expected 
to discover something like 50 Earths. By Earths, in this case, I mean size of the Earth and going around the stars at about one astronomical unit or in, within what we call the habitable zone. So Kepler expected about 50, in the end it got about zero. Regardless, it dramatically advanced our understanding of the actual planet view because on the left is the what we know about planets before Kepler went up, on the right are the yellow dots, especially dots which falls in the sort of low mass range, which can only be detected by the transit mission, those are Kepler's legacy. So what I would talk about is our study of this, all these yellow dots and what's interesting. What I'm gonna tell is, um, I understand this is a physics colloquium, so I changed my talk a little bit. Um, I'm gonna tell it more like a story. I'm gonna hide a fair amount of the technical details uh, behind the smoke screen, but you can ask me if you wish. But I hope to um, weave all this, uh, sort of all the work we've done over the past decade into a coherent story. So uh, let me start trying that uh, story. You guys don't have, you guys don't see the, is my screen uh, not blocked by any other? We see everything, it looks You right. see everything? Perfect, okay. So this yellow dot, this is what I call capital planets. What I first are gonna contrast them with is that when they were first discovered, they totally stumped us. They were unexpected. This graph shows why they're unexpected. Um, this is actually sort of in the sort of same sort of phase space, except every dot here is assimilated. It comes out of a computer. It's where we think as theorists where the extrasolar planets to be at. As you can see, there's a huge concentration of them near few AU because that's around what we call the ice line. It's kind of a sacred line in the Kroger-Prange disk which may or may not exist. And then those, many of those planets are actually migrated inward. And as you can see, there's kind of an empty region in here where we don't expect to see extrasolar planet. And the reason behind that, where we do have such an empty region, is really easy to explain. This planet, if they form in the gaseous disk, where you have uh, hydrodynamics at work, this planet's gonna excite density wave in the disk. That means it can impart energy and momentum to the disk. And that means it's actually gonna lose energy and momentum and spiral inward. That's what we call migration. And you can actually very easily calculate the so-called migration energy loss rate. You can see that if you put a planet, which is one Earth's mass at around this distance, which is 0.1 AU, so I'm scaling everything around here, um, it's gonna fall into the star in about a thousand years. In this simulation, they, everything that falls into the star, they just kept it in this graveyard. So you can see the huge number of, number of planets that have formed and fell into the graveyard. Okay, now I'm gonna overlap that with the Kepler planet. This is what I mean, it's very unexpected. They, they exist where we don't expect them to be. And not only that, they're incredibly abundant. By now we have done uh, lots of statistical study on how abundant this is. It turns out about 30% of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, so one in three stars, have this kind of planet, sort of low mass, very closing planets. And not only they have you know, one in three stars, and whenever a star has such a planet, they don't usually have it just one. They usually have, you know, between two to probably 10 or sometimes maybe even be 20 of them. So very common. So that was surprising number one. So uh, it stumped all the theorists and it still, this still remains a mystery in the field. Why are there so many planets in the region where we don't expect it to be? What I want to do, as I said, it's a story and the storyline actually goes along these uh, three figures. First is that I'm gonna show, the figure on the, I'm showing here is the same figure, but it's now period of the planet versus uh, size of the planet. So each one of these stars is a Kepler discovery, about a few thousand of them by now. This is the view we have of the Kepler planets in 2013. So that's actually when I started working on this uh, area because uh, you know the data is coming in astronomer theories are crazy after data so when this is a, you know there's a breakthrough like a mission like this and give us a lot of data you 
going there. At 2013, there's a problem. The problem here is the error bars. At 2013, after Kepler stared all the stars, um, they actually did not know enough about the star. So in terms of how big the star is. So this affects how, how well you can determine planet size, right? The planet going in front of the star causing a little brightness dip. And that fractional brightness dip depends on the ratio of the planet to the star radius. If you don't know the radius of the star very well, error bars like this, you get the same amount of error bars on the radius of the planet. So this is saying is we have a very, very fuzzy view. A few years later, we got a much better view. So this is uh, uh, done by the California CAC team, uh, California team, which uh, took a lot, a lot of time from the CAC telescope, one of our biggest optical telescope on the ground, and stare at many of the planet host. Stare at them well enough that you can actually characterize the stellar host and get the radius. And you can see the error bar shrunk. When the error bar shrunk, something dramatically happened. I'm going to talk about what happened. And then there's another thing that happened that uh, there's another revolution that happened a year later. And I'll talk about that. So the storyline I'm going to uh, talk about, so we'll go around these three graphs and see that our understanding is gradually improving as data is gradually getting better. Okay, so 2013, in the sort of prehistoric time for the Kepler field. When all these planets were discovered, they were reported, and there were lots of discussion in the communities about what these planets actually are. Um, you would not believe the imaginations people have um, in interpreting this data. So some people say, well, maybe this is, uh, like Earth, just incredibly massive, just a big rocky ball. But some people say, no, no, this may be because we think planets are formed outside the ice line, where ice actually condenses, we thought. Um, this probably is big ice ball. And you know, this is just big uh, snowball and then migrated inward. So they really are water world. So I, I, there's a picture there with a little dolphin or a little tortoise. Uh, some kind, of, some kind of life swimming in that water world. That would be really exciting. And then there's also uh, stories about maybe these are planets which have hydrogen atmospheres. We don't really know. All we have is science information. So this is my first ent or one, of, one of my first entry in the field. I just decided to play with the data and then uh, see what I can get. I divided the planet. Again, the same phase space, uh, period versus uh, radius. I divided the planet into red and green. So red means that they're closer to the star. And then plotted their size histogram. This is back when I don't know how to use Python. So you can see this is a really back, very uh, primitive uh, plotting. You can see that, the, however, you can see that the red one, red planet, the closer in ones are smaller. While the further away one tend to be bigger. So I went to a planet conference and boldly made the claim that, well, I know what these planets are. I think they are, um, the closing ones are rocky balls and the far away ones, the bigger ones are rocky balls, the same rocky balls like the earth, but then adding some hydrogen on top of it to make them bigger, about twice bigger. When I made this claim, I remember in the Aspen conference, some people who are in the know, and very expert in this field and who had dealt with the Kepler data, um, told me that, wrong. No, what well, you did must be wrong because you forgot about selection effect. What do I mean by that? Well, he said, because Kepler is looking at transits, right? And if you have planets which are very small in here and far away from the star, small and far away, it does cause a dip, but it causes a smaller dip and more infrequently. As a result, Kepler is having a harder time to pick them up. So you would naturally get these features. Further away planets has to be bigger to be detected. My interpretation was wrong. Of course, history, uh, I wouldn't be here giving the talk if my interpretation was wrong. Uh, so in that sense, I have the hindsight, uh, advantage of hindsight. Uh, but we have more evidence than that. Okay? At that time, even at that time, we were able to do a study which is called a TTV study. And what that does is that what we're looking at the transit times of the planet. And if that planet is in another, in, in, so orbiting the star together with other planets, they can 
mutually perturb each other's gravitationally and change the orbital period. That's what will be called transit time variation. And from there, you can actually measure the planet masses. So instead of going to a biggest telescope in the world and use radio velocity, you just take the Kepler light curve and figure out the masses of the planet. So this is the result. You can see that this is a radius of the planet. And I probably hear a physical quantity. I was told physicists use CGS units or SI units. Um, this is the density of the planet in CGS units. Human body is one gram per cubic centimeter. You can see here that um, there are a few models. Each one of this line is a model of a planet. If you have a purely water planet, H2O planets, it would, density will be one if the planet is very small, but the density will rise if the planet gets bigger and bigger. And that's just because you know, water is very incompressible here on earth. But if you make an entire planet out of water, it's actually compressible, so density goes up. So water planet will be going around the blue line and so on and so on. But if you have a planet density, which is around here, it has to have hydrogen. And you can see the points that we measured are lying um, all over the place in, this, in the sense that there are planets which definitely have hydrogen, helium, like our Jupiter does. But there's also a planet which is sort of in between water planets and rocky planets, or some even as dense as iron planets. So this is our first uh, view of these planets in a way. We're getting measured the masses and the densities, and how does that connect up to the claim I was making? Um, this is from a later study, but this sort of just shows the same result that it turned out not only the planets are smaller, closer to the star, these planets are smaller, closer to the star, they are also denser. So this is the density of those planets as function distance away from the star. You can see a general trend that if you're very close to the star, they tend to be about 10 gram per cubic centimeter. So that's about um, density of rock, a little bit denser. While if they're further away, they tend to have density so low, they have to have hydrogen helium atmospheres. So that I think supported our conclusion that our suggestion um, that um, the structures of planet must be like this, just by measuring masses and correlating with the distances, we realize there must be two kinds of planets. The super Earth, the bigger than Earth, that's why we call super Earth, which are closer to the star and very dense. The density is close to rock. And there's also what we call mini Neptunes, which uh, basically is a super Earth inside. But then on the outside, they accreted some hydrogen helium from the primordial disk and therefore become more like a Neptune inside. As a result, their density also dropped down by a factor of few. And that's what exactly what we're measuring here. So this hypothesis now is called the photo vibration hypothesis of photo vibration theory. It's somewhat well accepted, but there's one thing about this theory I think people don't tend to focus uh, enough. The basis of the theory is basically the sort of the most interesting statement I think from the theory is that all these planets that Kepler measured, all these 4,000 planets, independent of distance away from the star, the sizes, everything, they really came from the same type. They all came from mini Neptunes. And for some reason, 30% of the stars in the Milky Way formed those mini Neptunes very early in the primordial disk. And the, close ones get you know, stripped off and become bare, but they're really the same thing. There's just one population of planets. Um, this, eva this evaporation theory has gone through some multiple uh, uh, metamorphosis, getting more and more sophisticated with time. When we first did in the 2012, it's just an order magnitude estimate. What you say is that, well, if you're very close to the sun, the sun is emitting uh, some high energy photons. In this case, X-ray photons is the one we're concerned about. And each X-ray photon is gonna hit some hydrogen gas in the Neptune envelope. And you can heat up the gas to something like 8,000 Kelvin. That's enough to give this hydrogen gas a escape velocity away from the planet. So you can actually just automatically calculate uh, how much uh, you can strip off the envelope. Later on, we did a more sophisticated model using a sort of kind of internal model, internal structure model plus Parker wind, which is a sort of a sonic wind and so on. 
more sophisticated model also give this evaporation. So these are the Neptunes, which keep their envelope. But then very closing to the star, less than 0.1 AU or so, you can boil them down into Earth, super Earth, actually. And there's a bit of a trend. You can see um, here's the size here. There's a bit of difference. Here, you can see a bigger size range. That's because if you're very close to the star, even the bigger planets are more massive super Earth can be stripped off by envelope. But then if you further and further away from the star, only the very low mass planets, um, their binding energy is slow enough, you can strip them off. The more massive ones, they stay as Neptune. So that's a more complicated theory. But of course, nowadays, people do even more complicated theories. They're putting, uh, putting this whole process into uh, Athena++, plus plus hydrodynamic codes, and simulate the gas flow in such an evaporation flow, and also understanding all kind of chemical networks in the upper atmospheres. So this is the theory of this called photo evaporation. which I think is reasonably well established because of this slide I'm gonna show. And it's actually, after the fact, I realized we were, uh, we were kind of negligent. We produced this plot in our theory and we say, well, Neptune's here, super is here, and we produce all the observed phenomenon, but we did not pay attention to one feature on this plot. There's an emptiness. There's a gap in the sense that if the if the Neptunes are up here, um, they have a massive envelope and they're far enough away from the star, they can retain it. But if you put a Neptune in here, that means it's smaller. That means this envelope mass is really tiny. It's almost not as uh, thin as our Earth's atmosphere, but in sort of the same uh, fashion, then it's really easy to strip out that minute envelope. So they spend very little time in this little open area. If they are here, they just strip down to the bare core very rapidly. There's a void zone of avoidance. I didn't pay attention to it because I didn't think the data was good enough. Well, also I wasn't looking at my own results well enough. Data was getting better without me knowing it. Um, at three years later, 2017, um, this CAC result came out where the stellar parameter was much refined. And that big fuzz we saw earlier is now turned um, more into focus. And we start seeing some features and that's what we see the same gap in data. So that's probably uh, this theory is now, I mean, there are competitive theories, but the theory of something like that is well accepted. Um, we realize also that uh, give us the opportunity to use photo evaporation as a tool. What does that mean is that because we now know, you now know the distribution of planets fairly well, you know where the gap is, you know where the upper envelopes and all this kind of thing, you can actually make models what does the model give you? You can actually make models and figure out how much hydrogen helium those planets originally have. And the answer always comes out saying that, oh, originally those planets seem to only have a percent. Why percent? What's special about percent? We don't know. Hopefully uh, Eve's gonna tell us soon. And then we also figured out that from comparing the model, the masses of these planets seem to be about a few Earth's masses. That's why we call them super Earths, because we know the size of their core, where the most mass is lying. And the size of the core just depends on the composition and the mass. Composition, we can also determine fairly well to be rocky, and the mass, therefore, turned out to be few Earth's masses. What's special about that mass? I also don't know. We don't have, as I said, we don't have such an analog in the solar system. We don't have super Earths. There's another thing, which is sort of on the back of my mind. I'm gonna come back to it at the very end of my talk. And it's bugging me a lot. This is bugging me. In the theory, and it also looks like in the data, as you go, keep on going further and further out, going to, you know, AU size, a, excuse me, AU distances, about the Earth's region is empty. In our models, totally empty. 
because in our model, we said everybody starts as Neptune or 10 Earth masses. So obviously there's nothing here. But also there's nothing here because any kind of super Earth or Earth-like solid planets only become solid because they're so close to the star and got stripped off the envelope. So planets here, they weren't even in our story and they don't seem to be in the data. So why don't we have Earth? I'm gonna come back to that because I think that's one of the most interesting questions. Um, this is a, a plot you've seen before from the primordial data, a prehistoric Kepler data to the refined California CAC survey data. And you can see the radius error bar is shrunk. Uh, this is the sort of congregated histogram of the sizes. Before there was a huge smudge where the, the Neptunes and Earths are really kind of mixed together because error bar is so large. But because of refinement, you can actually see the peak. That's the Neptune peak. And this is the super Earth peak. And now this gap here is called the photon gap after the discoverer um, in the California team. Uh, Okay, actually, let me go back to this graph. Um, by then, I already thought I really should leave this field. I've worked on it for, uh, I don't know, four years, three, four years, and uh, um, everything seems to make sense, but there doesn't seem like much more to do. I was wrong again, because at 2018, something dramatic happened in astronomy. As a field, there was a bit of a revolution and their revolution is called the Gaia satellite. What happened is that the Gaia is a European satellite which went up to the sky, look at almost all the stars in the sky and returned their stellar parameters like distance to the particular star and in many cases, size, radius of that star. Well, as I told you earlier, radius of star is incredibly important in this transit business. So when you have a radius of a star, in this case, um, uh, for almost all the Kepler hosts, you can see the uncertainty in the planet radius gone down another factor of two. So when we went go from the prehistoric times to the California CAC surveys to the Gaia surveys, as you can see, the bimodal distribution becomes sharper and sharper in focus. What I'm going to continue to argue, however, <laughs> I'm going even further than this. I'm going to argue this sharpness of these peaks are even sharper than what you see here in reality. Um, even though Gaia is telling us these peaks are quite sharp, there's actually a couple other folds in the story which make them intrinsically or in the physical environment when you're actually going there to measure planet sizes, it's gonna be even sharper than what you see here. Okay, so the Gaia, what the Gaia was uh, able to give us is uh, stellar parameters, as I said. So the first thing you thought about is that uh, you can take all the planets we know and then distribute them by the radius or mass of the star. So for example, the sun is about here, one Earth's uh, mass. I'm sorry, and then, to, is, it, is it okay if I ask a clarifying question that comes from Professor Evely? Anytime. Yeah, so the question is, how much of the lack of small planets beyond 50 days is due to incompleteness in the observation survey? Okay, 50, it's approximately 50. It's almost, exclusively due to the incompleteness of the survey. However, the question is this, is it there? Um, it could be, it's there, we don't see it, or it's also be, it's not there. And I think we actually have a handle. I'm gonna come back to this question because it's one of the most interesting question, I think in this business. At, at the moment, it's completely completeness dominated, but we actually have some idea whether it's there or not. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is the first one of the first trick where we did to uh, narrow, nar make the planet distribution narrower than even the Gaia tells us. Um, when you spread it by the stellar masses, solar masses here, so this is so what we call so F type stars, and this is what we kind of call G type stars. Um, you can see that, that this is the Neptune peak and this is the super Earth peak, this is the radius planet. In the pre Gaia data, it's a smudge. After Gaia, structure showed up. Um, this was first actually noticed by Fulton and Pettigera. Um, they noticed it in the same sort of plot. They noticed that if you plot it by stellar masses, what we thought was just a single entity, the, super, the Neptunes, 
were actually changing from star to star in the sense that if you go to higher and higher mass star, Neptune seems to get bigger and bigger. Same thing for the supers. If you go to higher and higher mass star, things are rising up. Uh, let me sort of show this in the, which I think is more dramatic fashion. So this is the same sort of data, but now uh, com um, supplemented by some other uh, MDOR of data. You can see the trend that planets around more massive stars are more massive. Um, this is just for, in case there's some, any observers in here, I think this is sort of confusion in the field. And when you see a planet at this size, you know, 1.6, 1 1.7, uh, 1.6 Earth radii, people right away say that's a super Earth. Um, actually, that's not true. If it actually goes around a star, which is an M door, it's mostly likely in Neptune because of this trend. Okay, it's not a super Earth, it's got hydrogen atmosphere. Okay, um, again, when I pointed this out, and there's a lot of theoretical uh, deliberation after, after it, I'm not going to talk about it, but when I pointed it out, people again asked me, in every talk I went to, in every paper I wrote, the referee report, always say, Yan Qing, you forgot about the selection effect. What do I mean by that? Um, it's a very good point. Around bigger stars, more massive stars, which are also bigger, if a planet transits, if the planet is smaller, it's gonna, gonna cause a smaller dip. So it's harder to detect. In the sense that the planets here at this size are gonna be harder to detect compared to the same planet, same size, but around a lower mass stars. That naively will give you this trend, you think, right? And this give you this trend that the planets around more massive stars are bigger. I got so many complaints about this. So during the COVID times, I this is one of the things I couldn't take it anymore. I actually sat down and did all the completeness correction. This was also possible uh, only recently because the completeness, uh, star by star completeness of Kepler is finally published. Um, we now have a good characterization and I did it. So I now know for sure what I said was not completeness dominated. I would like to discuss what it means in two minutes. This is first to show the data. Um, this is the Gaia distribution for all the planets, Neptune, super Earth. And I said, the, it's already fairly narrow, but it's even narrower, what I mean by that, because if you split the planets by their whole star masses, for example, this is around um, K dwarfs, G dwarf, and so on, you can see this, features is moving up, these peaks are moving up. So this peak is actually a summation of many, many small peaks, which progressively move to a higher and higher end. So if you ask around the same star, how the planets look like around the star of the same mass, it's gonna be just one mass. Somehow nature knows what kind of mass planet should form around what kind of star. Um, in this context, this evap photo evaporation is really, we're really using it as a tool, right? Without photo evaporation, we're not going to get these beautiful features, this double bump feature with a gap in the middle. So we're just using it as a tool to figure out how the planet masses actually are. We're really measuring planet mass, but their sizes. Okay. So when, I, when one corrects for this, this peak, intrinsic peak is actually narrower. Dispersion of this uh, intrinsic peak is very narrow. Even um, now, the dispersion in this planet mass is only a factor of four. So within the, within the sun, a star like the sun, if super Earth is formed or this mini Neptune is formed, somehow their masses can only fall within a very narrow range, which is factor of four spread. Factor of four spread is huge for physicists, but for astronomers, that's tiny because you know planets can form any masses. In our solar system, the terrestrial planets from Mercury to Mars to uh, Venus to Earth, there's a two orders magnitude spread in mass. Um, if you go up to Jupiter, it's even larger dynamic range. So this factor of four, which I actually think much of the factor of four is actually instrumental because Gaia doesn't have a great, it's great, but doesn't have precise, precise enough mass uh, size measurement. I actually think the factor four is actually even gonna go down in the future. Um, we already have some evidence that in the case where we have very, very precise measurement for planet radius, 
in this case from this uh, this subfield of estrogen because of uh, estrogen morphology, the error bar has gone down. Better than Gaia, you can see the peaks are really narrow. So really puzzling. Why is it that when nature formed the super Earth, it picks only one mass? And why does that mass goes up linearly with the stellar mass? At the moment, I have no answer. I gave some suggestions, but I have no answer. Um, but the field has been really active in trying to understand any kind of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a shocking list of masses, special masses here. Um, some of them may be related to how the planet migrate in the disk. Some of them related to how the planet grows in the disk. And there may be other ones. The field is very active, I think, now in trying to understand what is behind all these, um, all these observations. I'm not going to explain the metallicity thing because I'm running out. Because I want to go into even more I can see personally more exciting topic. Okay, now we understand something about the Kepler planets. They all seem to have the same mass, regardless whether it's super Earth or mini Neptune, and they don't exist in the solar system. The next natural question to ask is that, what is down there? That goes back to Eve's question, right? Um, in this plot, where the Neptune peak is here, the super Earth peak is here, and this is the evaporation valley, you can see, well, also probably the Earth here, very far away, currently invisible in the Kepler data, even if it's there. The question I would like to ask is, do we have any constraint? Do we, can we figure out anything about how likely Earth is going to be there? In astronomy, there's this word called eta Earth. People like to measure the number, uh, so fraction of planets of probability of planets, Earth-like planet exists around the stars in the habitable zone. That's called the eta Earth. Um, this, so one of these uh, golden numbers, uh, people willing to spend six billion dollars on the Kepler mission just to find out that number, even though it failed. It's a very interesting number. How can we constrain anything about that? based on what we know about the super Earth and mini Neptunes. Anything that's born, that's produced in nature, that's not just super Earth and Neptunes, but actually more Earth-like. That's not just produced or formed in the protoplanetary disk, but formed much later in the so-called generation two category. Why is this an interesting question? Well, one of the, uh, if you so, um see my talk, you already realize that the supers are not very good for life. Why is super is not good for life? Well, first, super is forming the propensities, doesn't matter. But super are really a stripped down core of Neptunes. Because of that, they don't exist far away from the star. You can see that the number density here is already going down dramatically. At about 30 days or so, this is not selection fed, but about 30 days, we already have no super Earths left. There's no super Earths don't exist beyond 30 days. So even though they got a solid surface, they're not very good for life. Okay. Um, one thing I would like to see is that what's under there is any does nature produce anything other than super Earths? So this is a project a uh, uh, great undergrad student have been working on this summer with me, and uh, I will report his result in the next. Bill, how many more minutes do I still have? So it would be good if you could wrap up in the next uh, five to 10 minutes. Is that possible? I'll aim for five minutes. OK, great. OK, thanks. Um, we work on the project just to specifically answer this question. Is there anything else in the universe other than those supers? Okay, so this is, a, this is a picture of the known planets around K-Dwarf. We focus on K-Dwarf, but they're a little bit smaller than the sun. So we have a better, because you know, stars are smaller, so we have a better constraint on the planets around those stars. And you can see each one of these, uh, there's a Neptune uh, island, you can sort of see it, and then the super Earth, uh, little super Earth strips, and they disappear. And what we really like to know is that is everybody here super Earth? Is the number here, uh, number density of planets here is going up or going down? 
to do this kind of exercise, what you really need have to do is to, to get use completeness. What's the, the, the sort of the contour here is show the completeness. This is from the recent work by Berkey and Cantonara. Cantonara. What they do is that they, for every star Kepler stares at, they calculate the probability that a planet at that side, at that place can be discovered. For example, if it's point 0.1 here, that means if this planet goes around the star, 10% chance we're gonna see it. But this one we say, even there is a planet going around, yeah, it's only one in a thousand chance we're gonna see. Much of this reduction going from here to here is because the transit probability going down because the planet going further then it's less likely to transit. But much of it's also because a smaller planet, even though it transits, it's harder to be picked up by pipelines. So all these factors go into getting all these contour curves. And this is incredibly important. What we realize that uh, with these contours, we can actually do something, but we have to be very careful. What we did is that we chose only in this particular phase space to study the planet occurrences. We're not gonna take these things. For example, this planet, even though it's there, first is not terribly reliable. And the second is because the probability is so low it causes a huge Poisson fluctuation. We don't want it. So we only focus on the region where we have a good enough sample and good enough, not too low probability. So this is the little quiz for uh, people in the audience, even though I can't see the reaction. The size distribution of planets, I already showed you, that's a Neptune peak. That's the photon gap. And this is a super Earth peak. The question I really like to address with this project is that after the super Earth, you have to go to smaller and smaller sizes. Is it continuously rise or is it gonna drop sharply? I can't, I don't have an eye clicker or I can't pull you. So it's hard for me to gauge reactions. Um, but if you understand the question, you can decide the answer yourself and I'll give you the answer in uh, one minute. Okay, people and, are answering in the chat. We have one vote for down. <laughs> one vote for going down. Answer up or down, whatever you think. By the way, Earth is one. <laughs> Earth is one. So if it's going down, that means you know it's bad for you here on Earth. It's going down. Okay, we have one up or down, which is a funny answer. Right. And then, uh, one is just going with what uh, the previous answer was. So someone someone trusts someone else's opinion apparently. So. <laughs> It looks it's very hard to pull. I would, I would really, really be fun because I sort of, I sort of gave some clues about what it is, but it's it also like down is the down is the slight uh, consensus. Okay, you know I hate Sherlock Holmes because uh, in Sherlock Holmes you have to solve a case, but they don't give you all you give you all the pieces of clues beforehand. They sort of go along and give you new clues, so there's no way you can have solved at beginning in the beginning because you don't have all the evidences. I actually gave you pretty much all the evidences in the previous part of my talk. So you could have guessed it's going down and the result is indeed going down. So this is the peak, super Earth peak. We made it a little bit stronger. We'll put the Neptune peak on top of it because we know the conversion. Super Earth peak and it strongly goes down below super Earth. Another way to say is that we really seeing super Earth is ending. Remember I saying super Earth is a very narrow mass distribution. It's really ending very strongly. That's really bad for Earth because Earth is a one. If it keeps on going down, we shouldn't exist. Fortunately, there's a new population, which I now call sub-Earth, and it's picking up again. But there's a very strong statistical evidence that we have a new gap here. And we can do all kinds of funny statistics about this. You can you know, extrapolate this to one AU and so on, even though we only do it within 16 days and figure out what's the eight of Earth and so on. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, But I hope that gives me enough justification for the next graph, which is the space mission, a new space mission. We now know the super has really gone down, but there's a new population is rising up again, which we call the sub Earth. And they seem to be going up and up in number as they go to lower and lower sizes. We really don't know. We have very preliminary evidences. And then we have a huge knowledge gap from here all the way to habitable zone. If only we have a space mission 
which can give us three times more of those small planets, or even five times more if we are optimistic, then we can fill the gap and we can understand how likely Earth exists because we will have found many more Earth analogs. This mission I have in mind, there are two missions actually uh, currently under study. Uh, one is called the Plato mission by the Europeans. One is the called Earth 2.0 mission by the Chinese uh, space agency. Even have the hope of discovering Earth themselves. So by that, I really mean things that one of you in the habitable zone, um, projections that we can discover in the green bar, we can discover some like 20 of the Earth and Plato can discover about seven or so. If such a mission is fully funded, at the moment we only face A, we should be understand how often Earth exists. So that's my summary slides. I focus on the story about generation one planets. And I think I convinced you, hopefully convinced you that they're very puzzling. They somehow happen very commonly, about 30% of them, three stars out of 10. And they somehow uh, have a very narrow range of masses. Maybe it has something to do with this type one migration I said earlier, you know, we don't expect them there, they're there, so they have some way of surviving in those disks. And there's a lot of interesting thing else about this type one planet, which we now have some preliminary information in the way we have good enough. We have some sensors, first sensors for this generation one planets. And there's a lot of theoretical work to be done in this front, given all this data. And probably there's even more interesting data hidden in capital, which we have not teased out yet. On the other hand, looking 10 years down the road, I think we go into the next stage in this planet hunt, which is looking for generation two, Earth-like. That's the end, thank you. Thank you very much for this really nice talk. Uh, I really appreciated all of the, the elements that you put in for the, the physicists who aren't normally you know, exposed to these uh, ideas. So if you appreciated the talk, please write uh, so in the chat on uh, Zoom or either on, or on YouTube. Uh, I will share the transcript of the chat in Zoom with Professor Wu at the end of the talk so that she can see all of the good things that you're saying about it. Uh, and if it's I've okay- i got you fishing for compliments, not me. <laughs> well, no, I mean, these are, are free, freely available, I'm pretty sure. So I think the audience is definitely eager to, to type good things into the chat. So we already have uh, one hand raised. In Zoom, if you would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand feature. Uh, if you don't know where to find that, click the three little dots uh, with the word more under it and then you should be able to see raise hand next to it. Uh, so there are a couple of raised hands already. If you would like to ask a question on YouTube, please go ahead and type the question into the YouTube chat. My associate will pass it on to me and then I will ask the question for you. Okay, so our first question, the first raised hand uh, comes from Professor Nick Cowan and I will first allow him to unmute. Uh, now everyone in the session should have the power to unmute themselves, So, but please only do so if I ask you to. So Nick, can you please unmute yourself uh, and turn on your video if you like and ask your question. Sure thing. Um, so I, I've got two questions, but I don't know how to raise two hands in, in Zoom. So my, my first question is related to one of those last uh, plots you showed, which was very tantalizing, um, showing the, 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 the possible sub-Earth, this extra, yeah, this one. Um, so if I ignore the sub-Earths and I just look at that super-Earth distribution, it's got a mode at like, 1.3, 1.4 Earth radii. So if we believe that those are all the naked cores of what used to be like Neptune sort of ice giants or gas giants, um, then is that telling you something useful about the onset of runaway accretion? Like when those planets originally formed? Like, they, or, or maybe I'm misinterpreting and those super Earths didn't necessarily all start with a a heavy hydrogen and helium envelope? I don't know the answer, but I don't. So, so there are multiple processes in planet formation. You're referring to the process where big core, a big rocky, big uh, planet core can actually accrete gas very catastrophically and turn into Jupiter. So these ones are not Jupiter, these are Neptunes. So they, they have about a couple percent hydrogen. In that sense, they have not reached runaway gas accretion. 
I suppose what you may be asking is that maybe they have a very sharp cutoff on this side because if they pass this mass, they're gonna catastrophic accrete gas become Jupiter. I don't think so. The reason I don't think so is because of number statistics. This is huge. 30% stars have this, but only very few stars, much many fewer, about three times or probably more have Jovians. So Jovian don't seem like a natural destination. They seem to stay in this stage for a very long time or predominantly in this stage for a reason we don't know. Okay, and my my other question, this this plot is as good as any to to discuss it. Is you you made this provocative statement that all we're seeing so far are generation one planets, and that at some point maybe these sub Earths, for example, will be generation two planets, i.e., planets that formed after the dissipation of the of the gaseous disk. Um, how do we know that there are mm -hmm. any? population two planets like maybe yeah. all planets are population one and like maybe the earth formed yeah, no, when I, there was still hydrogen around i have no idea whether this should be population two or not the only sort of tentative and and uh, presumably having more of them would help because you can do the size distribution you can do the period distribution and then get some ideas um but one supporting evidence um sort of tantalizing is that these seem to have a power law distribution based on the data seem to be well fit by a power law, which is rising upward. And that has some resemblance to the Earth's terrestrial planet formation story where you get kind of a power law. That's the tantalizing. And the fact that, you know, all the <laughs> Gen 1 planets are all here. So what's left here, you know, just by exclusion, possibly. But you're right, I don't know for sure. It's a hypothesis. Okay, thanks for the questions, Professor Nick Cowan. Uh, the next question comes from Mohammed Aldeep. Uh, Mohammed. Oh, you hi, Mohammed. Hi, Yanshin. Great to see you. Great talk. So, I actually also have two questions. The first is: uh, Is the cor correlation between the uh, the super Earth radius and the stellar mass simply due to, the, to a correlation between the stellar mass and the protoplanetary disk properties and the isolation and the isolation yeah. mass? So naively, that's the first thing you say, right? More massive star for more massive planet. What's strange about it? We know that more massive stars have a more massive disk. More massive disk contains more material. On the other hand, observationally, those disks has a huge spread, two orders magnitude spread in masses. Yeah. You also know stellar metallicity has a big spread. Metallicity spread, disk mass spread, and whatever else I can think of, binarities and all kinds of things, other things, everything is going to be coming in and increase your spread. It's very surprising the observed mass has such a narrow factor. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, so uh, my, my second question is, you said that there seems to be a gap around one Earth radius. So, right. so, 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 so this actually makes our solar system extra weird because it actually has two right. Earth-sized planets, right? Right. Uh, uh, this is not, a, I mean, it's a power law, but it's not very steep power law. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I would say, yeah, it's, it's kind of, uh, it, the, there's a huge drop going downward. So 30% of stars have this, but only about 10% of stars or 20% of stars are, uh, we have evidence of this suburbs. And it's, we also don't know how this, when you extrapolate to one AU, is this number going to go up or go down? Yeah because we don't know the peer distribution. So don't despair yet until we actually find more. Okay, thank you. But at the moment, the solar system is an off ball in the sense that we don't belong to this super Earth club. We don't have them. We have Jupiter, but we don't belong to super Earth club. There's something really interesting about Jupiter too. We belong to this club. This, this, this club is the one that have closed binaries. So mm -hmm. they take up 20% of the stars and we belong to this 50% an anonymous club, which currently we don't have information, but don't know super first. Um, okay. Are we majority or minority? I think the jury is still out. Okay, thank nice, you. Nice to see you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have time just for one more question from Professor Eve Lee. Eve, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, sure. Um, thanks, Yanqing, for the great talk, as always. Um, so I actually had two, but in the interest of time, I'll just ask one. 
Um, so if you can go back to the the core radius um, plot that you had, yeah, that, oh, no, uh, the core radius with the dip at around one one of radius. Oh, sorry, everybody likes that plot. My student does a better job than I do. <laughs> um, so uh, just one clarification question because um, there was a paper that was doing similar work um, mm -hmm. by people in Penn State, so Sue et al. Yeah. I believe. And I think they found a continuous rise like with yes. no gap whatsoever. So I, I was wondering if you could comment on like what the difference. Yeah, we tried it. So yeah, I I was puzzled at it, and I tried it. If I don't put a box here, but extend it all the way out to however much I want, um, long, longer distances, what happened is that this points which are here and lo very low detection probability, they come in and really ruin the data. And they make your error bar and expanded your error bar so that you could actually not tell there's a dip or not. So my students actually try that and we reproduce their results. But on the other hand, if you restrict yourself to a smaller error bar, even though you have smaller, uh, smaller phase space, even though you have fewer planets, but because each planet is actually secure because the detection probability is high, you don't have to multiply by a huge number to get their uh, underlying population, you actually have better control. Okay. One quick question: Do you do you think that the radius plot might change as a function of a orbital period? Like, is it? It a does. It definitely does. For example, super has disappeared beyond thirty days, so okay. we're going to see only Neptunes. And then there is something here that we couldn't currently see. The back to your earlier question: Even if it's Earth, there we cannot currently see it. So we have no control or no uh, power over the size distribution in this range. We can only do the inner region, and it looks like inner region. That's the size distribution. And now it's a little bit left to imagination how you extrapolate it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Thanks. if you haven't already done so, please thank Professor Wu for an excellent uh, colloquium, either on Zoom in the chat or on YouTube in the chat box. And before I sign off, I want to remind everyone who is not a tenured or tenure track uh, professor. Uh, that you are welcome to join us uh, or join Zoe and the rest of the non-tenured and non-tenured track people for an après colloque where you can get to know Professor Wu a little bit better. And that concludes uh, this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. Before we end the live stream, I would like to just remind everyone uh, uh, that we will have another talk next week. Uh, the ne please also join us uh, at the same time, for another colloquium, next week's talk was entitled Welcome to the Milky Way, Gaia, the Galaxy, and Galactic Dynamics. It will be given by Katherine Johnston from Columbia University.